just start. Just go ahead, please. Thank you, Simon. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I am Nuno Oliveira. I work for Geo Solutions, and I will be doing these presentations with my colleague Marco Volpini. I will be the one speaking. He will be the one doing the, <laughs> the activities behind the scenes on the server for the live demo. Okay, so I will actually do two presentations uh, and I will build on top of what Katia has been presented on the presentation before. One of them is about the GeoServer Smart Data Loader tool. It's something new that we have built completely in the context of the API for Inspire study. And the second presentations will be about the feature templating, another module in GeoServer. That one has been around for more or less one year, but we have enhanced it a bit. Okay, so, okay, I can, I, hold on a second, sorry. Okay, so let's have a bit of overview about where GeoServer and Inspire integration is. So there is quite an history between GeoServer and Inspire. So uh, it's very well known that we support the download services uh, mandated by Inspire. It's also possible to implement the view services and the transformation services, although we are not yet there with the discovery services. The new thing that we also have now are the OGC APIs. We have started implemented a few of them in the context of a few projects. And one of them is the one that is relevant for this context is the features API. And these presentations, that's actually all of this workshop will mostly inside about the download service for Inspire, where before we are mainly done using the WFS uh, OGC services. And now there is a movement forward to use the OGC API features. So, okay. There is not only a change on the APIs, on the services or technology we are using, but there is also an important change on the format. So until OGC APIs come along with uh, pushing forward to have uh, output formats based on JSON, GeoJSON, JSON LD, one of those variants, before that, GML was the king in every aspect of the stack. So when you wanted to define your target model, it was based on a GML schema. When you wanted to define your mappings, it was based on a GML schema. When you wanted to query the data, it was based on the GML schema. So now we have a new API that brings a different format, a format that is, well, more suitable, for example, for integration between applications. You want to put a web page consuming your let's say your service, for example. And this is where things start to become complicated, but also give us a way to rethink about what we have been doing so far. So this is where we are starting from. Before I move forward deeper into this, I will be using during this, all of these slides and also the feature templating presentations, a very, very oversimplified use case to demo the functionalities. We'll also have a demo with real use cases, but for most of the slides, I will use a very, very simplified example, okay? So looking at what we have been doing so far. So we want to implement a download service in GeoServer, independently of being with OGC WFS service or well, with the new OGC API feature API actually OGC API feature. Uh, so at some moment or another, we add our target model or target output format or multiple targets output formats. And we have our data that is stored in a certain format, a relational database, MongoDB, an Azure data lake, you name it. And in some way, we have to map these two things and publish the data. The way this was done was with the application schema extension, which is actually a very, very complex, but very efficient piece of software because it was able to understand the complexity of the target model, the GML, map it to a data store, and then allow us to retrieve it in an efficient way and also to query over it. So this is the way things were done. And there is really no way to avoid the mapping step. At some moment or another, when you have a target model and a data store that were built independently, 
at some moment or another, if you want to obtain that specific output format, we need to define some kind of mapping. So this was working pretty much like this. So here I'm using the example as use case, a very, very oversimplified use case. So I name it the station, we name it the stations use case, where we have stations that do observations and observations will correspond to a parameter. For example, we have the Alexandria X, uh, station that had two observations. One was for temperature and another one was for the wind speed. And we wanted to output it like this in a GML 3.2 output format, where we have the station that will include several observations that will link to the respective parameters. So we have data that will relate together and we have data that are not nested into each other. And this was done by defining these explicitly mappings that we can see on the right. And these mappings were done starting from the target GML schema and saying, where those values come from, from the original data store. Then application schema, so your server is able to understand this mapping and be able to fetch the data, convert it to the output GML, and then also be able to understand query over these data sets, correctly translate it to an efficient SQL and retrieve the data. This is what we have been doing so far, either if we use uh, WFS or uh, the OGC features API. Okay, so in GeoServer, if, uh, well, we have actually, let's say, two types of, two big types of feature. Simple features is the usual ones we use to create layers, where, for example, we go to a database and we say, I want to publish this table. And I click on it and I can publish a layer, I can visualize WFS, WMS, query it with WPS, well, you name it. Then we add the complex features. Complex features, putting it in a very practical way is when we have multiple tables and in some way or another, we need to relate them together. And for that, we had to use application schema. So those are the two groups. But before we go into this more in more details, we need, I don't know, to take <laughs> a step back and look at what we are actually doing. So at the beginning, when we start this type of work, we have a problem. The problem is that we have a certain data modeling that was done and defined the target schema, GeoJSON schema, JSON LD, XML, you name it. And we had our data that was stored in a certain uh, in a certain way. Even actually, most of the times these things were defined independently. The data was created, and then only after the data we think about how we wanted to publish. Is not obviously the best way of doing it, but it's the way it was done. And that's the key. And at some moment, we want to take all of this and we want to publish it. This is, for example, what you do, what we do with an inspired download services. I want to say, look, I have my data, but since all the member states needs to be able to understand each other, this is all my data, the semantics that should be used to represent my data. And this was done with the GML schema. So I want to read from my data storage. I want to output things that match my data modeling and I want to publish them. The publish then can be with several things, WFS, OGC API features, or a custom service. Anyway, this is where uh, the smart data loader tool will jump in. At some moment or another, we need to define a data mapping. So we need to look at the data storage, we need to look at the data modeling and define how they actually connect to each other. Unfortunately, when doing this currently, we need to think about other aspects as well. Another aspect is the querying. All the middleware will actually query the data storage because we want it to be efficient. That's why when defining, for example, an application schema mapping, we need to do what's named the feature chaining, where we say, okay, the stations will connect to observations using this column as a primary key, blah, blah, blah. This is what will allow application schema to efficiently query the data storage and do that, implement that chaining on the GML output. And the same goes for the building. When you need to build complex features, if you ever have to use an application schema, you know that GML, as a very, very strong lead on how things are built. 
For example, if a certain way of expressing a certain semantic in GML is not supported by application schema, then we need to extend application schema to support that specific format. So there is a very, very strong connection between the schema, the data mapping, and the data storage. And this, I, I cannot repeat this enough, GML leads the dance. It leads the dance everywhere. So right now, with the coming of OGC API features, let's say that I don't yet publish my data using application schema. I don't have a, have a GML schema. I want you to publish it using the OGC API features. Well, guess what? We still need a GML schema. Some of the answers are B, well, let's just flatter everything out. Well, that's great, unless actually the data model only makes sense when you have nested objects. So how do we handle all of this complexity? So in some way, we need to be able to define some mapping in a way or another. We need to be able to control our output format to make it match what we need. Our system needs then to be able to understand queries on top of what we publish it and correctly retrieve data from the data storage. And in some way, we cannot forget about all the work that has been done in the past with WFS and GML. So the solutions we have, one, of part, well, one, one portion of the solutions we have come with is the smart data loader. So what we have decided to do is basically, let's break, let's get GML out of the picture when doing the mapping. And the mapping should be handled automatically by the computer because that's what computers are real good at, looking at something, interpret it, and kind of translate in automatic way to a diff, to a certain representation that is really be efficient for what we want to do. And in this case, what do we want to do? We want to read from a data storage and in our data storage, we have entities and we have attributes and entities we relate together. So once we take out GML out of the picture, things are actually pretty easy. So I have three entities, a station, an observation, and I have uh, relationships between them. So a station will contain an observation and an observation will contain a parameter. So that's very simple. And then when doing the publishing, I don't want to care about how efficient uh, I will have to query the data, if I will have to have a primary key, a view, a join. That's something that was dealt with by whoever designed the data storage. What I want in the publishing is to go, look, this is what I want as an output format and these are the values I want to see there. So that part about how we have an output format and we put what we want to see here will be deal with the features templating and that will be on the second presentation after this one. So on the next episode. So this is where the smart data loader comes in. I have my data. The smart data loader doesn't care about GML. Okay, it will look at the domain model from the database, it will be the domain model in memory and will produce a streams of feature. Basically that streams in memory streams, actually that's important because it will make this very efficient. Look, I have a station, a station will have an observation and observations will have a parameter. If you want to access all of this, you just reference them. And then we have the OGC services and OGC APIs because we maintain backwards compatibility that are able to understand that stream. Then we have the output formats you want to obtain and in the middle we'll have the features templating. So what's, what's the, let's look more concretely at, at this smart data loader. So in, on the right we can see a bit how it will look like. So basically what we'll do is that we look at the database, you'll we'll walk through the domain model. If the database, for example, is very well defined with foreign keys, this will be a full automated step. So it will look at it and will tell the user, look, this is the relationships what I found. These are the attributes I found. Are we interested in all of them? Yes or no? If yes, then internal Finally, and this is where things become interesting because one, we cannot just throw away all the amazing work that has been done by, I can almost say a generations of developers on application schema to tweak the SQL query, to tweak the integration with more exotic data stores. So instead of starting from scratch, basically what we do internally is that we generate an application schema mapping 
as well a GML mapping. It means that with this model in GeoSan, where we can start to publish complex features, like we are published simple features. We just create the star and we click in publish. For complex features, what's the deal here in the context of Inspire is that at this moment yet, we still don't have a control on the output format. So unless our GML schema or the database, they were designed with the same structure, well, the the output that will be produced by smart data loader will not match what we expect. Cool, but that's where features templates will come in. Okay, looking at the workflow of events, typically the user will look at the UI, will create the store, the smart data loader will go to, in this case, the PostgreSQL, will read the domain model and will say, this is what I have. It will generate an internal application schema mappings, an internal GML schema that the end user will not need to touch and should not touch because it is, is managed automatically by your server. And then it creates an in-memory complex features. That's it, it's a stream of that. And then with the feature, if we don't define any templating, then they will be just outputted using the default format, which will follow the original data store one. When you want to match a specific target output format, we'll use the features templating. So I will do a quick demo right now. So I need to exit this presentation. Let me know, Kat, if you, can see, if you can't see my Geo server, otherwise I will assume so. Okay, this will take a bit to start. So this is a live demo. As usual, something will probably go wrong. <laughs> Let's go as far as we can. So we already have these stars, these stars created. I will delete them. Okay, let me be sure. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I create everything from scratch. So we have two PostgreSQL data stores, which will be our source of data. One of them contains our very oversimplified use case for the meteor stations, and the other will contain some real use cases that we use in the context of the API for Inspire study. Okay, Th this name will change, will be smart data loader. Well, <laughs> something we need to fix. Anyway, when I click on it, so, okay, I have to choose the workspace. In this case, I will create my meteor stations and I will have to pick my data store. So here I told GeoServer, look, I want to create this store, this smart data loader store, and I want my domain model will be fetched from this PostgreSQL database. And then GeoServer will tell me, okay, these are the root entities I found. I click on stations. So it just walked the database and told me, look, this is what I have. This is the domain model I understand from the database. We have a meteor stations, a meteor observations, and a meteor parameters entities. The stations will contain the observations, and the observations will contain the parameters. Or was your server able to find that information automatically? Because when we design a relation database, we define foreign keys. We tell the database, look, these entities will relate together. Yes, there is certain case we don't do it. I will talk about that later. So I click on save. GeoServer processed the data model. It generated GML schema behind the scenes and it generated an application schema mappings. And it tells me, yeah, go ahead. You can just publish it. It automatically detected the default geometry because I only have one. I can compute everything from the data. It detected that my geometry was actually a point. So he selected an appropriate style and I can click on save. If I go to my layers, here we go. I have my layer here. I can visualize it, it with WMS. So I have my three stations here. I can go here and request them in GML and I can see my stations. So I have a Meteor stations features, which contains a list of observations, which links to a parameter. Okay, then I can do the same for pretty much all the other output formats. Here I will do it for GeoJSON and there we go. So doing this with uh, application schema, defining the mappings in Hile will have take a lot more of time. But okay, here we are still comparing apples to oranges because this is the default output format. So 
it's, it's a great victory because we can publish complex data like we are doing for simple data in GeoServer without worrying much about the mappings itself. But in the case of Inspire, we have a, usually a very, very strong opinion about the target output. And at this stage, we cannot yet influentiate this. This will be discussed in the next presentation. So, okay, now I have a, more, a real use case. So let me put this a bit bigger. Okay, so this is the use case I will build next. It's based on the initiatives uh, and some COVID data related reports. So we have a table of initiatives. Each initiative will have an endpoint and this endpoint will relate with several entities. We'll have an access mode, a data type, an output format. And then we have a many-to-many -many relationship between endpoint and indicator. So an endpoint may have multiple indicators and indicators may be present on different endpoints and an indicator related to a vocabulary. Doing this on application schema required a defined view. Why? Because we are stuck with GML. And so GML typically didn't care about this initiative association. So this was a collision because when defining a database, an efficient model on a databases, we needed to add this intermediary table, but in GML to represent the data, we don't really need it. So it was a collision between the two ways of representing the data and GML win because it was the king. So now let's look at the smart data loader. I will create a new store. I will come, I will name it, okay, geo. COVID, I will choose the database I want to read from. Here I have a lot more of entities. I will go with the initiative one. Here we go. So we can see that you have, a, a, well, a lot more of relationships, obviously. So we have the initiative table that will contain the endpoint that will relate to access mode, the data type, and to an output format. Then we have the Indica indicator initiative associations, which relates to indicators and then to vocabularies. By the way, I can click and this will basically, if I do this, it will remove the endpoint relationship tree from the mapping. So that's what this checkbox are about. Okay, here we want to see everything. So I click on them again. Okay, here we go. Behind the scenes, your server will see, okay, these entities, I need to generate a valid GML 3.2 schema. I need to generate the mappings. And these are the top root features. I go to initiative feature, I click on it. So this one doesn't have the geometry. So it's a pure, uh, it's, it's, well, it's not to be represented in WMS basically. Okay, I will select the default one. There we go. I click on save. If I go to my layer preview, it's actually this one I want. GML, there we go. We have our output format with all the nested objects that basically we can see. So there is a lot of nesting. I don't think there is a point in walking, but I mean, it's quite a complex model. The important aspect I want to is the association. So since we are not tied anymore, since we free our mind about GML complexity, we got rid of this. Uh, yeah, we cannot have the, we can have the association. This is something we'll deal with when we actually define our output format templating. But for now, this table is still part of the game. So there we go. We can see it and we can see all the related data. And obviously we can do the same thing for GeoJSON. If I go to Pretty Print, I have all my structures. So I have an initiative that will contain an array of endpoints and each endpoint will have an access mode, data type out format. Not all of them have associations with indicators. Let me, find, here we go, we have one here. So, okay, this endpoint has actually uh, several indicators that we can see here with their vocabularies, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So what we saw here is that we make GeoServer smart data loader tool, look at the database, read a complex domain model, publish it on GeoServer, and you can see and query this complex data structure. 
So the next slide is about querying it because that was obviously, so it's not only about publishing. Once we publish these data sets and applications, users, well, basically at anything that will use it, it will start to query the data. And querying the data means that I need an efficient language to query it. And we need efficiently to translate that query to the original data store so we can retrieve data in an efficient way. What does this mean in practice? For example, this filter will be translated by GeoServer to an SQL query that will retrieve the data from the Postgres SQL database. Okay, so this is just a simple query in XML and you can see retrieved that feature with the project code one, there we go. We can then do the same thing uh, using, uh, ah, this is WFS, but obtaining GeoJSON. There we go, we still obtain the project one. And then we have here using a more complex features where we actually go very, very deep on the structure. There we go, we can obtain it. So this was to check Donald link. If I look for it, there we go. We retrieve all of them that are the download file. And the same thing, you requesting this in GeoJSON. Cool. Now, obviously, this is integrated because remember this slide is super important. This, this completely decouples all of this. So there is, I look at the data store, I build any memory streams of data. Then I have my services that do what the hell they have to do, translate querying, querying the data, and then we have the output format. So all of these things are completely distinct, which means that if I implement a functionality here, it will be available to these services. And if I implement a functionality here, then it will be integrated with these features templating. So that's what happens here. We implemented this mapping. It's available for WFS 2.0 as well for the OGC API features implementations in your server. Okay, I want one that I can read directly. Here we go. Okay, so this is the OGC features API GeoJSON output, which gives the meta links to re this is what Cathy was telling us about. So from an output, we can find the links to navigate to the next one. This is super useful for machines, not that much for humans. And uh, well, the same thing with the complex example. There we go. So again, here are the ones that have the, I cannot search actually on this, okay. So that was pretty much it for the, okay. I have a problem with my screen, sorry. Okay, so in terms of next steps for the data loader, obviously there is the features templating, which we'll talk about in a moment. So this work has not yet been contributed to GeoServer. We'll, we need to start actually a full discussion with the GeoServer community so we can have some interesting feedback as usual. And with also some feedback from the GeoServer veterans as well from the GeoTools projects. But this is mostly syntax sugar over application schema. So an UI and some processing tools on top of it. Right now we support mostly actually, sorry, only Postgres uh, data stores. In the future, we would like to add support for Oracle, SQL Server, MongoDB, there has been news on to this. So instead of integrating MongoDB, MongoDB is taking a, a different route where we can read directly from MongoDB. This uh, astronomically improved the performance. But well, that's for another presentation. Hello linking tables on the fly. So when we have a database model that doesn't have explicitly foreign keys, be able to see on the UI, this table actually referenced this one. And well, some more fine grained tweaks like specify explicit the default geometry, uh, define different primary keys, small things. Uh, Okay, so when will this happen? So when we get the budget for it. So as usual, we this is an open source free extension of your server. And it will greatly depend on the community, on the users, if this will be pushed forward or not. This specific work has been financed in the context of this API for Inspire study and by BRGM, which actually give us the remaining budget to close this. So it was very nice from them. And uh, that's pretty much it all I have to say about this smart data loader tool. 
if you have any questions. I don't know, Kathy, if you want to take over and do your slide um, question. Well, let's first do, do if we have direct questions on this while they're still fresh from people's brains. And then I would go into the next round of the survey. Okay. Short request to all. Does anybody have questions on what Mark, what, what Nuno has been presenting to us? I'm not sure if you can talk. If not, put them in the chat. Alternatively, you can also ask them at the end. Otherwise, you have to go into the next round of survey to threat. <laughs> uh, Nuna, the re release timeline. Mm -hmm. The release timeline. So we'll start discussing the community next week. So beginning of March, this should be should be out. Uh, the idea is to include this with, uh, along with applic app scheme extension because, well, again, it, it needs it. But I will have to say we'll have to say what. The so now that you've seen a bit more of what we are really doing, does this support your requirements towards your desired applications? I'll give you a moment to figure out where you put your Mentimeter poll. It looks like people are getting happier the more they see. A few people are still looking for their cell phone or wherever they started Mentimeter. It's down there somewhere unless you closed it. If you did, you can still go to menti.com and use the code listed at the top. It's no problem re-engaging at any time. Okay, I'm going to assume that we're more or less settled on this one. Next question. Is it possible to, to, to map your use case specific requests to the filter mechanisms we've shown? Okay, so we have a few detractors saying they're missing some bits. Again, as also in the previous questions, if you have some specific points, please get in touch with us. Maybe we can get this sorted in upcoming versions. I'm assuming we are down to 17 active survey participants. I mean, I, I do see up at the top, there are 55 of you signed up. And a lot of them, a lot of you are being very quiet here, but that means that your feedback will not be coming in. It's your loss. But e even if you haven't answered no here, if you provide us feedback, we will try and input it into the wherever we can. Okay. <laughs> so next question. Is it clear how to handle, spe handle specific errors? <laughs> Where I admit I'm not surprised, I, I would also be a bit lost on this point. No, no, if you get really bored at the end, you might want to explain what we've all missed, because I think here we have a resounding no. 
So there's definitely work to be done there. It's nice to see that people are starting to dare to participate. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we forgot to mention how do we do what do oh, we wait, do when things is doing that? weird stuff on my screen? That's that's why things keep popping up there. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Is he confirming the no, 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 no? <laughs> okay, I would say that is a very clear, resounding no. <laughs> All caps. Next question. Could you act as a playground to experiment with the, with the, the API? Have you found our toys? I mean, this is actually nicely in line with some of the previous answers, also the lack of examples. I'm seeing the audience split into sort of a, a few people deeply enough involved that they know all of the details anyway, and are actually just participating because they're bored. And the other people are a bit lost. <laughs> I think there was a comment by Alexandra of the previous question. It's too bad of not having an option. I don't know. <laughs> Um, too bad I can't find my chat right now. Um, I, th therefore, I'm reading it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. I mean, a lot of this, we will know a lot more in a year or two when we've actually tried out. Theory is nice, but after reality has bitten you, you really know where it hurts. Okay, for future surveys, I will make sure to add an I'm lost, what am I doing here option, sorry. I'd say access to the playground is about a 50-50 split. I will go on to the next question. Could you access the necessary documentation based on the API endpoint? Okay, this is a bit better than the previous ones, but it's also showing us that we we do need to make better access documentation and make all of this more available, findable, and properly linked from all places. 